Ready? Hit it! Hello everyone and welcome to Twice Nightly The Podcast with Maria Lovelady and Michael Allen Bailey, a podcast that aims to bring everything variety out of the wings and into the limelight. So what are we waiting for? Let's raise the curtain and start the show! Coming up on today's show, we speak to the brains behind Tall Vine Idiot Artistic Director Paul Hunter. We find out what finally made Michael quieten down for a few seconds. <laughs> and hear all about Maria's Boxing Day experience with my panto organ. <laughs> Well, here we are, Series 3 already. Can you believe it? I can't. Welcome back, Michael. It's lovely to finally be back doing this. We know that a few of you have been in touch to say, when is the next episode out? And here it is. Here it is. Well, it's always, end of the year is always a really, really busy time for us, isn't it? Because we're always off in panto land, as so many performers are. Me on stage, you behind the scenes. Not in the same show, unfortunately. Unfortunately, not in the same show. We're still waiting for that to uh, re-happen again. But those of you who are keen fans will know that that is happening again very, very soon. And more details about that later. But yes, yeah, so I was directing Peter Pan this year, which was gorgeous, a fabulous show. I really enjoyed it. And the best thing about directing for me over Christmas is that you get the Christmas period off, which I'm pretty sure you've, apart from maybe COVID year, you've never, ever had in about 10 years, have you? No, I haven't. No, except for COVID year. And I hated it. It was awful. It was awful not being in (laughs) Panto. The only good thing is that you get to watch all the Christmas films that you normally don't get to watch or that you only get to watch really, really late when you come in from a show. I was going to say, you definitely watch all the Christmas films regardless. Of course I do. I stay up till wee hours of the morning, like matchsticks in my eyes, like dropping off every two minutes. But you've got to watch Love Actually. And The Love Is Gone, which is one of our favourite smash hits from Muppets Christmas Carol. So those of you who don't know Mike personally, which is probably quite a lot of you actually. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) Mike always has a sort of Christmas order that he watches films in and he does Mm. the same over Halloween and it's the it, is it always the same or does it change or are you just really organised, you and your brother? Certain, well, not so much now with doing pantos and everything, but um, there are certain films that I have to watch at certain times. It, it's it's a very scattered system, really. It's not as, as, um, it's not as neat as it could be, but it makes sense in my head. But the fact that you even have a system is pretty funny because most people would just be like, oh, the holiday's on ITV, let's watch it. Oh, yeah, no, no, there's a there's a time and a place. And there's certain films that you can watch early on in December that are kind of Christmassy but not too Christmassy. Mm-hmm. And then there are certain films that you have to wait until, like, the teens. Does that make any sense? It does. It makes sense <laughs> to me. Whether Listeners, do you do a similar thing? Let us know. Do you watch films in a certain order or the certain... Because it's not just Christmas films, is it? It's like... You do it for Halloween and yeah, everything. Oh, yeah. Have you got yeah. a favourite Easter film? Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, even though it's not <laughs> an Easter film, but I always associate it with Easter <laughs> because I got the VHS for Easter one year when I was about five. So I always associate Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory with Easter. Oh, please get in touch and let us know if you associate <laughs> any films with random occasions in your life. We would love to know. Anyway, we have digressed a little bit because I wanted to speak to you about your panto experience because I want to know what it's like being in the director's chair. Oh, well, it's my second time doing it. Last year was obviously 2021, COVID year, so that was extremely stressful. This year was much more smooth. I think I had a baptism of fire last year. It was like my first first time directing a big production panto, had COVID. This year, it was an even bigger show, actually. And it was just so much fun. I just really enjoy seeing everybody do their bit. And I think when you're performing, you focus so much on yourself and you're aware of what everybody's doing, but you're not like, you don't have an eagle eye on it. To be Mm -hmm. able to sit back and watch like a really great comic, an amazing dame, you know, even like I had a, I had a principal boy which was fantastic. Wow. We talked on this podcast before about how Principal Boy is less and less popular as time goes on. So I had a, a fantastic girl, Holly Jones. She was playing Peter Pan and she was excellent. And she did it with such um, 
this gorgeous balance of you knew she was a girl, she was still quite feminine, but in this, I hate the phrase tomboy, but you know, just this, mm-hmm. um, she just had the cheekiness of a little boy and, yeah. and she just was absolutely amazing and had every kid in the audience on side. So that was just a real pleasure because when you're directing it, you get to sit and dissect and go, ooh, that's what's working, that's not working. and. Yeah. And then ultimately put it all together and then think, well, yeah, I'll steal a bit of that next time I'm in one. (laughs) Any new (laughs) listeners, go back to our Series 2 interview with Alison Child if you want to hear more in-depth chat from us about Principal Boys. Oh, gosh, yes. He was (laughs) a campaigner for the Principal Boys. I know know that you would, but um, would it take a lot for you to get back on stage in a panto now that you've been a creative? I... That's a really good question. Oh, I feel like I'm on the podcast. What would it take? What would it take to get you back on stage? Money. Apart from a ton of money. <laughs> um, no, I really, really like doing them. It's just the time of year. So, yeah. again, something that I think is very unique to the region of Liverpool is that Panto it can be found all all year round, can't it? And I don't yeah, no, think totally. that's, it's not very common uh, outside of Liverpool, but li- like the North West put mm-hmm. Pantos on all year. That for me is fine. The difference is the Christmas thing. Having yeah. when, because I was finished on the 18th of December and then I just had a relatively normal Christmas, like a nine till five person. And that was really great. But I tell you what would get me back on stage, just as a, a little link. I went to see a couple of nights ago the last Saturday evening performance of jack and the beanstalk at the palladium i'm so jealous it was phenomenal it was breathtaking i've never seen anything like it i don't think it w- it doesn't fall into a category of anything else it was like seeing it was like seeing a royal variety show in a lot of mm. respects it was just a really fabulous array of variety talent with a very, very loose plot line, which they constantly referred to how loose it was throughout the show. And <laughs> it was like being in Vegas. You felt like yeah. you're in Las Vegas. You, you just were completely transported. I didn't think about anything else for the whole time the show was on. And I think that's true entertainment. My my mind didn't wander to outside that, that story and what the world they'd created on stage once while I was in there. And so, yeah, that that would get me back on the stage, darling, if they would have me. Fabulous. Well, I thought you were going to say working with me would get you back on stage. (laughs) Well, we are going to be back on stage. And those of you who are following us on our social media will know that we have finally released our dates for our 2023 tour of Twice Nightly. Woohoo! So you can buy your tickets for that now. We're going to be at the Royal Court Theatre in Liverpool, the Shakespeare North. We're going to Blackpool Grand. We are going to... The Gladstone Theatre in Port Sunlight. We're going to so many places. So come on to our social media, check it out and buy your ticket and let us know when you're coming because we would absolutely love to meet you in person. And new dates and new venues are being announced all the time, aren't they? We're kind of announcing them as we're finalising because there's still loads in the pipeline. There's still loads that we're confirming and we're, we're getting into. So we are very, very excited to just spread the twice nightly love. We are. Can I just can I just throw something in? Because we didn't talk about my panto, oh. can I just say? <laughs> Which was fun. Um, we I was in Cinderella at the Stockport Plaza, absolutely beautiful theatre, and we broke all box office records. Did you? We did. That's because the, your name was on the bill. That is absolutely why. Wow. Mike's <laughs> panto, I went to see it on Boxing Day. So that's another perk to not working, is that you can go and see all your fabulous friends do their thing. And it was such a gorgeous panto it Mm. was like a like a true fairy tale panto it had this gorgeous organ that lifted from the pit of the orchestra and then would like and then went back down it was just the dancers I love the choreography so just beautiful costumes beautiful scenery the story was just told just, you know, if we were just talking about the Panto in the Palladium, which had absolutely zero plot. This actually had a really, <laughs> really strong plot. And that's what I mean. It felt like a fairy tale because there was a full story there. And Extravaganza Productions, who who put on the show, run by um, David Vickers and Richard Chandler, they do everything. So all the costumes were handmade, all the sets were hand painted. Everything is done by these 
two fellas. It felt like a labour of love, so that completely doesn't surprise me. Yeah, no, totally it was. It was it was a brilliant show, lovely show to be part of. But um, yeah, so now I'm hungry, as I'm sure you are, to get back on stage, which is where our show comes in nicely. And we're performing, actually. So we're recording this is Monday. And on Wednesday, we're going to be at the World Court Theatre in Liverpool for their Lunch Variety Club. But that is completely sold out. So there's no point in doing a plug for that because it's all sold out. <laughs> but we'll, <laughs> we'll uh, report back on how that went next week. But what have we been up to this week, Mike? Because we have been very busy beavering, aw- beavering away. Do people, beavering? Do people still use that expression? Beavering away, recording some amazing interviews for you. Something very, very special is happening in London from the 19th of January right the way through to the 5th of February and it is the International Mime Festival. Now, we have covered this show and you will hear next week we are talking to Joseph Selig and Helen Lanigan, who are the directors of the festival. And you'll hear that in the episode next week and them talking about what the festival is, how it started and all of the fabulous places like the Barbican, Sadler's Wells, Jackson's Lane, Wilton's Music Hall that are hosting this fantastic festival. This week, we're focusing on one show in particular. So we are going to be looking at the show Stan and Charlie. Now, we'll delve into a little bit more about the show in a minute. But just to let you know the date for Stan and Charlie, so you can go and see it yourselves. It is on at Wilton's Music Hall from the 18th of January to the 4th of February. It's on at the Mercury Theatre in Colchester from the 7th to the 11th of February. It's on at the York Theatre Royal from the 14th to the 18th of February. It's on at the Mast Mayflower Studios in Southampton. Hampton from the 21st to the 25th of February and it's on at the Derby Theatre from the 28th of February to the 4th of March. Well done Michael. Thank you very much. Now we'll link all of that information in the show notes and of course you can find it on all of our social media which is generally twice nightly the theatre podcast across all platforms. So we won't talk too much about this because Paul Hunter, who you will hear the interview with now, he directs the show and he knows everything there is to know on this subject. But what we would say is that we got to sit in rehearsals after we'd done this interview and the show looks incredible. So funny, so moving, so full of energy. It is everything you want from a classic show. It really captures the heart of those old silent movies. And yet there was something so modern and fresh and energetic in it that you can completely understand why they're recreating it for a modern day audience. That's it, isn't it? It it seems to be quite a niche show, but it's really not in the sense of there is something for everyone in the show. If you're a fan of the theatre, you will love it. If you're a fan of film, you will love it. If you're a fan of comedy, if you're a fan of music, if you're a fan of variety in the traditional sense, if you're a fan of variety in the modern sense, if you're a fan of break dancing, if you're a fan of clog dancing. Clog dancing. And who isn't a fan of clog dancing? Who isn't a fan of clog dancing? You show me someone who isn't a fan of clog dancing. <laughs> So here we are talking to Paul Hunter, the artistic director of Told by an Idiot Theatre Company, whose work you will have seen across the years all over the country, I'm sure. Shall we get him on? Let's get him on. Here he is, the fabulous Paul Hunter. So happy to be here. We really are. We really are. What a beautiful place as well. This is a great venue. It is. I I didn't know there was a theatre here and we come to rehearse. You feel like you're... In Scandinavia or something, with this wonderful, yes, that wonderful is exactly. lake outside. Uh, I've, I've, we've done a couple of shows in Helsinki, and it feels like I'm in Helsinki with a nice coffee shop. But yes, no, that's a lovely absolutely view. Absolutely, what it feels like. It does. It <laughs> does. Or Liverpool, you know, the Liverpool. Or Liverpool, Rocks. absolutely, you know, yeah. home from home. Yeah. Well, now you've mentioned Liverpool, that is a good link to the show because this show began life, did it, as part of the Unity? It did. It did when we first created uh, Charlie and Stan back in 2019. It was co-produced with ourselves, Tom and Idiot. And the Unity Theatre Liverpool, which we have a long history with, uh, going back to 30 years, uh, Unity Liverpool, Theatre Royal Plymouth, and the Royal Ndunga in Northampton. Wow. And at what point then did the show grow into being something to be part of the Mime Festival? Well, when we, as I said, when we made it back then, going back to the beginning, of course it's like any of our shows, they're, 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 they're made from an idea. That <laughs> it's not like we you know, pick a script off a shelf or we commission a writer to write us a play, we have an idea or an idea is brought to us in this case. And then we explore if there's a possibility in the idea. So you don't quite know what it is. And if I'm honest, 
initially, even though I knew a lot about Chaplin and Laura, because comedy is really important to us, and I did know about the true story of them both being in Fred Carnot's <laughs> musical troupe. I didn't know all the detail. I didn't know that uh, you know Stan went on for Charlie at one point. So all of this got me quite intrigued. But I was still a bit nervous, to be honest, about... I kind of asked myself the question, did the world need another show about these two famous people? Because, yes, you know, there's do. loads of films. <laughs> I know, that's very nice. Feel. But I've got, I've, got to be, I've, got to, I've got to interrogate this, because, you know, it was around the time when the Steve Coogan, John C. Riley movie came yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Great film, about Stan, and obviously the films of Chaplin. So I thought, I've got to have something that feels us and feels quite original to do it. And the key, in a way, was when we were in research for it and we were in a room with some actors and we managed to create about 20 minutes of material where no actor spoke. And I suddenly thought, well, maybe we could do the whole show like this. So I said to our producer, maybe it has no words. And initially she went, what do you mean it's got no words? Slightly nervously, like it's going to be some weird experimental. I said, no, I think we could make our version of a silent movie on, but live on stage. And I think at that point we were talking to venues of which... Uh, Unity was one, as I said, because there was such a big history there, and, and, and we love that theatre. And I think that was a point where those partners, if you like, invested in the idea and went with it. So fairly early on, once we kind of had this... Two things. The one was the thing with no words. The other was I was worried I didn't want it in any way to be a documentary. It's not a documentary. <laughs> it's based on fact. But we call the show a true fantasy. So... <laughs> very deliberately so it, it, it takes place on board this ocean liner which they sailed from Southampton to New York and shared a cabin all true but we use that journey on the boat for 80 minutes to depart into the past into the future and into the world of the imagination and the imagination was key to me because mm. I thought as I said you can watch documentaries you can read books and so the key again for me was we did an improvisation where they were in the cabin and I was very interested in the difference between Stan Laurel and Charlie Chaplin so Charlie, in our world, in our show, is very particular, very tidy and very neat. Mm. And Stan is very chaotic, you know, right, like yeah. his character. Yeah. So we thought that's great to have this clash in this tiny little cabin. And then we had a scene where Stan was frying a fish on the bottom bunk <laughs> and it was driving Charlie mad. So Charlie gets the frying pan and whacks Stan on the head, as you would in a silent movie. And you think it's a comic moment and he hits him again. And then eventually Stan falls down dead. And suddenly we thought, this is brilliant. So Chaplin kills Stan Laurel and has to get rid of the body. So we really liked this and we, the actors loved it and we riffed on it. Because in a way, what was great about it was, of course that doesn't happen, but what was great was we had a kind of nightmare and, and Chaplin dealing with the body, mm -hmm. could a dead body could be in any of his movies. That's what's great about it. You go, you, it isn't from his movies, but you thought, oh, I can imagine this in a Chaplin movie. And that then made us think, well... What we don't want to do is just recreate moments from the films. Because, again, there's yes. no point you can watch yes. the films. Mm. Yeah. So what we then thought, well, maybe we can create material and routines that are genuinely original but feel like they're from the movie. So the thing that I'm proudest of is when audiences come out and they go, oh, what film is that from when, when Chaplin comes out the suitcase and you go, it isn't. Yeah. So I think that's much more interesting that we try to capture the spirit rather than doing an impersonation, because I, I, I don't really see the point of that, because if you try to do what Chaplin does, you'll never do it, because yeah. he was yeah. a genius, yeah. likewise with Stan. Yeah. And it's interesting because you have, in this uh, version, Chaplin is played by a lady. Yes, no, Chaplin's always been played by a woman. We had, oh, okay. uh, we had a, a wonderful performer, uh, Amalia Vitali, who played it originally, and then went away to have a baby. Although that's quite Charlie Chaplin, him having a baby. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, that wasn't possible. And then I thought, how do I find another woman to play this part? And then I brilliantly met Danny Bird, who is absolutely extraordinary, and he's a brilliant Chaplin. But... The reasoning behind it, people often say, well, why a woman? Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting for me because as I thought about Chaplin, I thought my focus as I started to research it initially was his movement, how he moved, his movement quality in a way. As Me as a performer, I thought I watched him again and again and again physically and he was such an extraordinary mover mm -hmm. yeah. um, and almost like a dancer. And there's a mm. true story that when Nijinsky, the... Russian, famous Russian ballet dancer, saw Chaplin perform and was introduced after. And Nijinsky said to Chaplin, where did you train as a dancer? And Chaplin said, I didn't. So this element made me think, well, maybe... And he's so feminine, he's so delicate and yeah, light, very light when you watch him. Very. 
I thought maybe that allows it to be a woman. That, that, and then it then takes the pressure off the show a little bit as well, which doesn't go, oh, look, we're trying to be Charlie Chaplin. It is Charlie, mm. and the audience completely accept that. But the, in a sense, the, by being a woman, it slightly allows us to go further. There's a, a really key moment in the show which I love, which is where we wanted a scene where Chaplin seduces somebody in the audience. So Danny's on her own as Chaplin, and she gets eye contact with a woman in the audience every night. And basically, where do we sit? No, you're okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and through the kind of power of destruction, she manages to get a woman out of the audience, and this member of the audience swims with Charlie on stage. And I remember thinking, oh, God, this is going to be difficult to do this every night. Every single night, women of all shapes, sizes, ages, backgrounds, they all get up wow. to swim with Charlie. And I, I started to think about this the more I saw it. I thought, what, what is it that makes those women get up? And I think we started to talk about it, and I think it would be very different if that was a man playing Charlie. Mm. My hunch is that the woman might feel a bit more reluctant. They might think, oh, there's going to be a joke at my expense, or he's going to get me up, and, and mm. there's going to be something funny business. But because they both, they kind of know it's a woman, I think they go with it more, if that makes right. sense. So you have a tension where you kind of know it's a woman but you forget it's a woman at the same time yeah so that those are the kind of reasonings really but it's the same with with stan you know jerome who brilliantly jerome marshall really plays stan for me it's really interesting you know he's a young mixed race actor from stafford and when i finally after really rigorously auditioning him four times offered him <laughs> the part he said when the audition came through from his agent saying they want to see you for the part of stan long he said yeah he, he said i had to double check are you sure you know, as I said, as a young mixed race actor, he said, I, there's no way I thought I'd ever be considered for Stan. Mm -hmm. But for me, again, it's about the spirit. I don't want yeah. someone who looks yeah. like Stan Laurel. Yeah. I want someone... And also, I do believe that passionately, theatre is about the imagination. Mm -hmm. It's about what you allow an audience to imagine. It's not about reality. It's, it's metaphorical and it's, uh, you know, it's all of those things. And so. it's not really a tribute show, no. No. is it? It's a not full tale, all. so therefore they, those characters can look like anything. Exactly. It, it's it's a, you're absolutely spot on. It's not a tribute show. It's a really fully formed, hopefully very funny, very enjoyable entertainment that celebrates these two extraordinary performers. And in a way, it opens up a question which I got very intrigued by is, it kind of opens up the question of maybe this was the greatest double act that never was. Mm. Yeah. And I, I quite like, I'm quite intrigued by that because for me, the more you look into Chaplin, <laughs> Chaplin was never going to share the limelight with anybody. No. No, <laughs> no <laughs> way. Not and, at all. And sometimes, you know, not for, you know, he was clearly, a, you know, had a fairly big ego and whatever, but also we show in the show we have a scene which touches on his horrific childhood his victorian childhood which i know you're very familiar with that you know his father dead from drink at 30 his mother in the asylum him and his brother in the poor house when he's eight years old horrific mm. and i think even to escape that is one thing but to escape it and become the most famous person in the yes. world mm -hmm. is kind of extraordinary so and I think, still le like uh, yeah, recognizable yeah, totally. as an icon today Absolutely. even people that don't actually know who he is it's would recognize a picture of him in a restaurant or something he's like yeah, it's extraordinary. One, of those people. one of the few iconic and I think to, to, to achieve that, you have to have an incredible drive. And I think that's what I mean about kind of not going, oh, I could be in a double act. Whereas Stan was a very successful performer and he, he was successful in silent movies, but he hadn't quite made it until he met his soulmate, until he was yeah. paired with Ollie. Yeah. And that's, you know, the rest is history. So, but, but that's what I like is the difference. And, and it, the show allows you to touch on that when they, you see them on the boat practicing routines in, mm. in Carno's troupe and you go, oh, no, no, Charlie's very much the, you know, the drive here. And Although the irony, of course, is that in Stan and Ollie, it was Stan, Stan was, it was very, very much, much the creative force. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Ollie was a brilliant performer, but he was very happy to finish work, go and play golf yeah. or go yeah. to the racetrack, <laughs> wasn't he? <laughs> he was. Whereas Stan wrote them all, direct, yeah. you know, should have directed more of them, really. He really should. If he'd kept control over it. So you look at this extraordinary clown, but he was the driving creative He's force. He's your hero, isn't he? Uh, Laurel and Hardy are my... Uh, yeah, they're I can't quite articulate what they mean to me and what they've meant to everything that I've done. They've been such an inspiration. And so going on that then, Paul, like you said, you know, so much of it is based on this sort of fantasy element. How much then do you encourage or do you encourage the actors 
actors that are playing these characters to absorb themselves in the work of Chapel and Laurel? You know, do you encourage them to go and watch the films? Do you encourage them to, you know, seek out interviews and things like that? The autobiography. The, the very famous, infamous that autobiography in. that no, Stan, Stan isn't in. Yeah. I think it's really, uh, of course, it's crucial mm -hmm. that, you know, the, 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 the performers absorb themselves mm -hmm. in, in that, in the, the, those two figures. I think the focus primarily for me was more the performative element. Yeah. So I, we, we watched endless film, and I know the performers absorbed, you know, hours and hours of watching how they move, mm -hmm. their physical quality. Their, so that there's no shortcut to that. You know, they just have to go away. And it's no chore, of course. It's yeah. an amazing thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, that was an enormous. And we had, you know, a, a kind of library of material, of which there is many. You mentioned the Chaplin autobiography, which is really fascinating, for that very reason that, you know... Stan throughout his life always referenced Chaplin, even always. when he was an old man. Yeah, there's some did. footage where a recording of, of of Stan talking about Chaplin very warmly, saying, "You know, he was the greatest clown of us all." Mm -hmm. And then, as you say, when you read Chaplin's George Bryant doesn't mention him once by that, which was another reason for me wanting to do this show was that difference, you know. Um, and then there's the great for me the the great Chaplin biography by David Thompson is an amazing book about about Chaplin. So yes, they they absorbed themselves and continued to do. But another key element to the show, I think, which uh, there are many, you know, but one when you're talking about Chaplin, we worked with a brilliant Belgian uh, uh, comedy physical comedy consultant called Joss Huben, mm. who who was a teacher at Lecoq School in Paris and was a founder member of Complicita. And I'd worked with him before, and I thought. Yes, we've got lots of skills in the room, but what Joss doesn't know about physical comedy is not worth knowing. Mm -hmm. So I said initially, can you come over for a couple of days? And the performers have, I also cast the performers quite close to the age of Chaplin and Laurel. I, I could yeah. have gone another route and gone for more experienced performers, <laughs> and you know, you age them up and down, but I thought, no, let's cast them close to that age. So the drone hadn't done very much when he joined us, and, and what Joss brought was such a, a kind of rigorous physical investigation mm. of how these two play. And that's a key element of what mm. I think how they've, it's developed. Yeah. Because I think your rehearsal process, a lot of the time you work from movement and music as well. I know that's a big element to this show. Yes, I mm. think I often, uh, I want to say almost exclusively, but certainly almost all the time our starting point is physical. Our way into something is visual or physical. It's, and that's to do with where we trained and what we who we are. But yes, and certainly you couldn't. It would be for me slightly bizarre to approach a project like this if it wasn't through the prism of physicality. Um, but you're right when you say music. Music is a crucial part of how we make our work. And when I going back to when I said about creating the twenty minutes of silent material, I thought, well, we now need a, a, a live score. Mm -hmm. and, you know, like they would have had a live piano score. And I went to a brilliant jazz pianist called Zoe Rahman, who we'd collaborated with before. And that was very deliberate because I didn't want music that came from a so classical idiom. That didn't feel right. Even though some of Chaplin's later scores for some of his feature films were slightly more coming from that tradition. Mm. In the earlier films, they're coming out of the birth of jazz in America. Yeah. So cinema and jazz in America were kind of fairly close together as they emerged as new art forms. So I thought the jazz thing would be great. When you watch those old films, that's exactly what it is. So Zoe brilliantly wrote a kind of score, which has space in it to improvise, of course, which is what we needed. And uh, Sarah, who is amazing in it, Sarah Alexander, who plays that live every night. I just go, Aww. and of course I'm used to it now, but I kind of go, I have to stop myself and go, wow, that's an amazing thing to play mm -hmm. for 85 minutes <laughs> live, watching what the action is. So is it um, eight to five minutes all the way through? Yes. It's interesting that the timing of it, I'd say just over 80 minutes because um, I, we were thinking about it. It was a bit longer and then we were thinking about it when we came back to it last year. And then I think it was the producer said, how long are Chaplin's fe yeah. features? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Gold Rush, City of Light. And they're all around 80 minutes. Mm. And I thought, that's quite a good thing. you know, Because when the audience come in and they they don't know what to expect. It's really interesting, they, they watch the beginning and there's music and no one speaks and they're enjoying it and then it continues with no one speaking. <laughs> and you can feel the audience going to a particular place. And mm -hmm. I've heard audiences say this, like, oh, I didn't expect that, but it, it's really magical that you're in a world where suddenly no one is speaking. And, and I think there's a kind of almost finite time that you can hold the audience in that place, if that makes sense. It's it's not something that should be have an interval to break that bubble. It's got to sit in a 
we go look come into this magical world which you don't normally inhabit mm. of, of of movement and physical comedy and so that yes it was based on the chat i thought well if it's good enough for chaplin he knew what he could do <laughs> we could do that but it's it's not just i've mentioned sarah and then of course we have nick haverson in the show who's a really he's more my generation he's my generation brilliant physical actor who plays fred carno and it's Charlie's dad, but also live drums. Mm -hmm. So the great thing is we have not just live piano, but we have drums as well and that. And he plays the drums yeah. too? Wow. Yeah. wow. No, they're a skillful bunch. Oh my well, God. So why don't you just let us, our audience that may not know, who was Fred Carno and why were Charlie and Stan on that boat? That is a, a very good question because I think Carno, certainly now, few people would know. I think my dad used to reference him. There used to be mm -hmm. an expression. My dad died years ago. And, but I remember my dad saying... I do remember this, that you know, if our house was a bit mad with the kid, us kids and everything, he would say something like, blimey, it's like Carno's army in here. <laughs> and I remember this, I thought, and I had no idea, what, but it was a sign of him saying it's really, it's really chaotic busy. Yeah. or busy. Or, yeah. and, and I look back on that, I think that was it. I think it was mm. a phrase that went before my dad, it may have been his yeah. dad, or yeah. that the, it, it was a reference to this crazy musical. And um, when you look at, back at Carno, in modern terms, he would be a superstar empresario. He would be Completely. like, I don't know, Andrew Lloyd Webber or, or of the yeah. musical. He was the king of the musical. I mean, his shows would tour all over Britain. They would go to Paris. They went to America. I mean, him and that group of performers, which Chapman, obviously the most famous, and Anne's dad, uh, were superstars. He and was a group. kind of theatrical Walt Disney, wasn't he? Yes, really? that's a he very good way of putting yeah. it. You can he had... steal that. Because his ideas were kind of... So ahead of their time and really eccentric, and yeah. he was he was so Surreal. much bigger than just let's put a show on. No. Surreal, and he liked colour and lights, and yeah, that's a yeah. Very, that's a brilliant way of describing mm. him because, he, of course, he was a producer and mm -hmm. money and all this sort of stuff, but uh, he had lots of ideas. I mm -hmm. mean, Chaplin, you know, credits Carno with enormous amount, and yeah. and when Chaplin started to establish himself in Hollywood, he bought a lot of those performers from Carno to Hollywood. A lot yeah. of those actors we see in those short movies. They're all mates of Chaplin's from because he knew there was a shorthand, yeah, and there was no script, he could mm -hmm. bring them over. That you know, okay, we're gonna do this, and that. he'd know exactly what it was. So, he was a, an enormous figure who's kind of passed slightly into into folklore, but uh, it, it, it's in some ways he's the reason. I mean, he brought them together in a sense, yeah. and um, uh, we have a scene in the show which I, I really like, which again, Stan talks about where. Chaplin was already established in the troupe and he became quite quickly quite famous in the troupe for playing a, a drunk aristocrat mm -hmm. where he would be in a box in the auditorium and the, the show would be going on and he would be drunk and fall and, and the audience didn't know initially and then they'd cotton on and it features in the Robert Downey Jr. movie they show this clip in that and, and, and Downey Jr. is brilliant physically in the sequence you know he's falling in and out of the box and um, uh, so that was his Chaplin stick mainly and then apparently legend has it somewhere like Darlington you know 10 minutes before curtain up Chaplin went to Carno and said I want more money you know I'm playing this big role and and Carno went no I'm not giving you anymore so there's this confrontation so Chaplin went all right I'm not going on so he left the theatre five minutes before curtain up so Stan had to go on and Stan talks about this again later mm. in life he said it was really nerve-wracking because Chaplin was the star of the show. But he went on and Stan, of course, nailed it. Yeah. He said, what was most terrifying is when I was on stage, I looked down and in the fourth row, Chaplin was staring up at him like this. Oh, no. <laughs> so he'd obviously gone out. <laughs> they'd, they'd gone round, bought a ticket, <laughs> got him. And that's what I mean about going, keeping an eye on, you know, uh, the kind of up-and-coming performers. Yeah. Stan being a bit younger and he's clearly good. Mm. Yeah. And Chaplin's going, okay. Everyone's replaceable. Yeah. Like Chaplin's replaceable, we all are. Exactly. And I think, <laughs> I think even in the early Chaplin films, when I said he brought in a lot of, he, in some ways he helped out, mm -hmm. maybe people who were a bit, you know, having a hard time, mm -hmm. like Connor, he brought them over, but he always made sure he had the funniest business. He, yes. wasn't, he wasn't going, oh, you can come, I'll give you that. He's the one who gets the last laugh or the last kind yeah. of laugh. Yeah. Um, but and no, I think that, like you said about the, the autobiography, it's so... Uh, 
curated, yeah. isn't yeah. it? It's a real, like he was saying about his early history. I mean, that is chapters and chapters and chapters yeah. in the book of his early life. He wanted people to know the struggle and where he'd gone. Yeah. But I think what a lot of people don't realize, which is true, is how much he did pioneer early movies. He wasn't just acting in them, like he was mm. doing everything. And like you say, even and down stunt to work, casting and, and stunt work and you know, how the, all the editing, mm. when you read the hours and hours that they spent editing. I think that's really, really, we touch on it slightly in one moment uh, in the show, but I think that's a really interesting point because that's what's extraordinary about him as a figure because, of course, as we touched on earlier, he created in The Little Tramp one of the most iconic figures in history. And as you said, even now, people who don't know him, or at his time, you know, in the, the middle of a jungle in the Amazon, someone would know that figure if you yeah. showed them that's extraordinary. Yeah. But you're also right, he was there at the beginning of film. Mm. He was a pioneer. It wasn't like he could go to film school and learn about it. Yeah. He learned about it, and not only did he create that character, you, and there's a very strong argument to say that Chaplin's one of the greatest film directors that ever lived. Mm. You know, if you look at a list of top films, there's always two or three Chaplin's in the top yeah. of those lists. And then, as you say, editing. Then music. I mean, mm -hmm. he, yes. he went on to write all the music mm. for, yeah. his, for his shows. You go for the films, you go, this is extraordinary. In, the, in that sense, and I think that's what kind of sets him apart, I, I, I think. But you're right, the, the autobiography is, is curated is a good word, it's very considered, mm. it's very measured, it's very set out, and, and of course, I, I'm sure, you know, he wouldn't have been the easiest person to, to, to be around, I'm sure, and, but everything is controlled, you know, even, <laughs> you look at those films, they're not, they're, they're full of anarchy and madness, but he is the figure going, Okay, I'm, I'm bringing this all together. Mm. From everything you've said so far, Paul, it doesn't sound as though you have been, but did you ever feel um, restricted by having the show set on such a, a, a limited set? And, you know, a boat, there's only kind of so much you can do, isn't there? But by the sounds of it, you get you guys still manage to well, do everything. It's, it's, that is interesting, and, I, and I, I, uh, you'll see the set when you pop in and have a look. It's, it, it, the brilliant designer, Iwana, young Romanian designer who, who came to design it for us. And I'm looking at the water out there in Helsinki slash Canada water. Um, <laughs> Next time we meet, we'll yeah, be in Helsinki. Helsinki. In Helsinki. I, um, I said to Iwana as a provocation, I said, I think it's, it would be good if the whole story does take place on the ship. Mm -hmm. And we basically say, at the beginning of the show, which you see, we see Connor's troop get on board the ship. And at the end of the show, we see them get off in New York. And that's the kind of time and that can be elastic this sea journey can become whatever we want it yeah. to be but I, I gave her that kind of a provocation and then when she came back with the initial drawings I thought this is brilliant because what she'd done had, had she designed a kind of version of a boat but she'd done it in such a way where she said I wanted to imagine that this boat had been at the bottom of the ocean for a hundred odd years and had been pulled up so all of the wood is rotting and warped and so it feels like something of the past which is so brilliant so that was great but then and sometimes we didn't know how we would use them then we started to think okay what can we put in what can be in this set mm -hmm. that will give us opportunities to play so i said to her i said it'd be great to have a trap door somewhere uh i don't know how we're going to use it but that would be good i said it'd be good she had two life rings, one on the f back of the boat and one on the floor here. I said, it'd be good maybe in that life ring there, we, we hide a trampoline. So there's something that someone can go bounce on it and we don't know it's there. <laughs> so the kind of trying to think a bit like Chaplin and, and the possibilities of environments. And then because we had the trap and we started, this is what the set gave us, I think. We started to put together the show and we improvised the, the journey of all these crazy Carno cats getting on the boat. And we, the cast came up with some brilliant invention of these different people getting on and how they got on. I kept thinking, Charlie can't just walk on the ship. Now, mm -hmm. After we've seen all this, Chapman has to enter in a really surprising way. And my eyes suddenly went back to the trap and I thought, that's a really small trap. What about if we've had a case that can sit over that trap that Chapman can come out of? <laughs> so that's how he enters. And we're gonna look at this bit when we go down. But it looks like you wouldn't get a person through it. And of course, suddenly it opens and you see a hand and you see the iconic hat and he manages to get out. And then it's a very Chaplin entrance. So I suppose what the set we were always looking for was what's the surprise? Mm -hmm. In the way that Chaplin in the early films, when there was no script, would often just choose an environment. Yeah. There's a brilliant short called The Floor Walker, set in a department store. And Chaplin says, 
I just wanted him working in the department store. No mm. script. We'll make a film here. And of course, he was obsessed because they were quite new. Was the escalator? Yes. So there's a brilliant thing where you see him trying to go up and he's falling down again. But all it was was location. And yeah. So we treated it a bit like that. We just went, okay, we've got our location. What are the surprises? And uh, and our designer brilliantly came up with loads, which helps us kind of move backwards and forwards in time. And you know. And how easy is that? This is a very sort of boring modern day question. How easy is it to incorporate all of that with all the health and safety restrictions that we have now? Because obviously back then there were none, for better, for worse. And kind of, they had no fear, did they, about, about pushing the boundaries? And if people got injured, people got injured. But now it's such a big thing. Can I say thing. that is not a boring question at all? That is a really, really <laughs> relevant question. And it's one that we have all the time because... We live in a culture, which in some totally. ways is, is, is good, where you, c- you, can't, you can't move a table without their being <laughs> Whereas we're dealing with people who would throw themselves off a building or, yeah. you know. So there is a kind of, we laugh sometimes about the contradiction between what we're trying to do <laughs> yeah. and what the building will allow Your you to do. stage managers are just like, oh yeah. my God. Or, oh. or even the theatres we go to, there's a sequence where we do that scene I explained about where Stan goes on for him. And in our version, we see... Hopefully, in one of the bo- if there's a box in the theatre, we use one of the boxes. So, in one of the boxes, we see we suddenly out of the box in the theatre, we see Stan being the drunk, and then in the other box, you suddenly see. So, they have a kind of uh, sort of I don't know physical face off in these two boxes, and of course, the performers are often climbing around the thing. And then, when you're in a really beautiful theatre, you know, like we're in Theatre Royal Bath, you know, which is this beautiful theatre. We want I wanted Stan to climb out of the balcony. And the people go, you can't do that. This is 1830, and he's clinging on the side of it. Not in so, Bath. Exactly. So there is there is a challenge sometimes, but also, of course, it's a really physical show, and the actors are brilliantly uh, agile, skillful, and all the time, like you know, technically able to yeah. achieve an enormous amount, whilst at the same time, hopefully, not injuring themselves. You know that. But uh, it is interesting, though. No, it's, it's a different time and a different world, that's for sure. Mm. So we know that you have you wear so many hats because you are mm. artistic director of Told by an Idiot, the creator. You are that you've written the show. You are directing the show. But you are all, and you've got an amazing podcast yeah. which we will link to in the show notes. But you are also an actor. So if you were going to be in this show, who would you play? That's Ooh. really interesting. Ooh. When we came up, when we came up with the show, I think there were some assumptions about maybe me being in it. Or I think people around the team and around me went, "Oh, so who are you going to play?" And um, and obviously, you know, I'm I'm slightly older uh, than the, than Charlie and Stan were at the time. And once it became, also, I think I became too interested in the story to be in it, even though I I do wear a lot of hats. What I don't enjoy, I've only ever done it once, I don't enjoy acting in something and directing it. Some people are right. brilliant at yes. it, and Chaplin obviously was a genius. But I don't really enjoy it. I remember mm-hmm. doing it, and I thought, when I did it, I thought, when I'm acting, I'm constantly thinking about direct the directing. So I'm in the scene thinking, God, we must do this, we must look at that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I'm directing, I'm thinking about the acting, you know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't enjoy that. So quite quickly I thought no it's not right I, I'm interested in writing it and directing it and then getting a crap team if I was to be in it I suppose the obvious casting would be Carno. I think um, there's something about this blustering funny <laughs> slightly idiotic figure in the show who who, who, who in our version uh, Chaplin and, and uh, Stan Charlie and Stan run rings around him so I, I think I hope I never have to. I'm sure <laughs> Nick's never off, so it won't happen. But yeah, I think uh, I'd probably be Carna. I'd be interested to know what you think, Paul. Why do you think modern day audiences, even audience members and even people that kind of profess and consider themselves to be film fans, why do you think there's a, a there's a, almost a fear of silent films? People avoid silent films and... You know, like I say, even people that say the connoisseurs of film, they'd be like, oh, but I wouldn't really watch a silent film. Why do you think that is? Why have we... That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because there is an argument, Mm. which, again, I've seen various people express, that silent film is the purest film. The purest film, film. yeah. Mm. If you actually... And a lot of very, you know, very contemporary famous directors have said this. Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, you know, very established and well-known directors have said that's because... It was a big thing for Alfred Hitchcock. Of course, Hitchcock, exactly. A classic example. And I suppose film, fundamentally, you would argue, is a form of visual storytelling Mm -hmm. that's told Mm -hmm. through image. Now, 
course there's lots of examples where the script is amazing but it's fundamentally that yeah um it's interesting that journey as you say of of how people maybe are are uneasy around it now <laughs> the i know um and it's as i said because i it, it, you know we're 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 doing our play with no words mm. and we made a conscious decision very early on when we first i joked about my producer but when we talked about it a couple of times to venues it clearly slightly put them on edge mm. i just feel it in the meeting mm. really into it and then when we did mention no words you could feel them slightly go mm. and i think it has connotations for a modern audience mm-hmm. they think it might be as i said a bit weird or a mind play which as is not as is just a play without words mm. so i said to our producer i said i want us not to reference I'm referencing it here it doesn't matter but at the initial time I said I don't want to put it in our copy I don't want to talk about the, the fact that it is silent we can talk about live piano score mm. but I just want the audience to come in and encounter it and it made me think I'm still pondering your question it made me think about that wonderful film which did very well called The Artist yes, yes. remember this yes. Yes. massive movie yeah. great which film. won Oscars it did, on yeah. sort, didn't it yeah but it was a very successful mainstream movie mm-hmm. And I remember again reading about that where people would go to see that film and my sister going and loving it she said, I had no idea it was silent and people just went and encountered it <laughs> so I, I I think sometimes it, it it's good if you do, if you don't have to uh, draw your attention to it but I yeah. think I think I don't know I think maybe people f- perhaps feel it's going to be something that's archaic or hard <laughs> to connect with or <laughs> The Whereas, attention span, I think, yes. as well. I yeah. think people's attention spans are shorter, maybe, yeah. than they were, because we're so used to being bombarded That's with true. sound. That's true. That is true. And um, it's, it's interesting because a lot of film, a lot of really good film, exists in the world where people aren't speaking very much anyway. You know, it's yeah. an interesting thing because you can watch a film open, a modern film, <laughs> and for 10 minutes someone might not speak. You're not confused, you're following the story. Well, all the Marvel stuff, which is probably the biggest movies at the moment, the, the scripts must be like so paper thin, <laughs> exactly. there? there's nothing in them. Exactly. And it's the same story again and again. Yes. But it's all the action and yeah. the looks and everything. <laughs> they, a lot of that is silent and with an amazing underscore. It's true, and also when you talk about scripts are interesting because I... People often say to me, well, how did you write it? Mm. And, and there is a script, but it is literally 10 pages long. And what's weird is when you look at this 10 page script, you go, and then there's an 85 minute piece of theatre that's come from it. I think it's, it's interesting because I think initially I thought I need to create a structure, almost a bit like a film storyboard in a sense, mm-hmm. you know, beginning with the departure and arrive, ending with the arrival and, and create a kind of structure to allow the actors to improvise within it. Now, sometimes I had a very clear idea of, this, of the scene and what I thought would happen in it. Or I might know the beginning of the scene and the out of the scene, but I, I, that was a structure which enabled... Because I strongly believe when you're asking or inviting performers to improvise, they need enough to go on. There's got to yeah. be something mm. that they can anchor in. Yeah. But the thing that became interesting for me as, we start, as I started to write it and we started to make it is if you work without words... This might sound an obvious thing to say, but it slightly dawned on me. You go, and you're not miming, you will end up with a show that's got a lot of objects. <laughs> our show, our, our poor stage <laughs> management, are setting hundreds of objects. Because, of course, objects help you tell stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they enable you to move through a narrative and also enable you to create significant moments. Mm. There's a moment in the show, there's a famous photo, which is, it, it might even be in Chaplin's... Uh, autobiography where he actually has a photo of Sam and still doesn't mention him by name yes, but there's a there photo yeah, on board the ship yeah. Yeah. We, we recreate that with the life ring and Chaplin in the library we recreate that photo in the show so you see that and then later you see the real photo in a in a supposed reunion years later when ah. Stan goes to Charlie's house he he gives this picture and uh, so and and then at the very end of the show you see this real photo projected onto our red curtain. And I, I, that's what I mean about objects. I really like the fact that they not only tell your story, but they can become very significant mm. in the relationships. Mm. Um, and what I love, it's a bit like when you see those movies, you know, based on something real, and at the end you say, oh my God, that's the photo of the real person. Yeah. So I deliberately wanted to end with the real photo, large on stage. And it's amazing how many people come down to the front and want to look at... <sighs> because it's an interesting... When you say something is real or true... <laughs> And, but it's in the theatre, 
something about that happening in the theatre makes people doubt whether it's true, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. There's an odd thing where yeah. you go, this is true, and then people go, the amount of people that come up to me afterwards and go, so were they really together? And you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that photo real? At the, yeah. And it's some, maybe less so in film, but on stage, yeah. because you know it's not real. You know someone's pretending and they're dressed mm -hmm. up. That when you say it's real, I think people go, hmm, mm. is it? Yeah. It doesn't spoil, it doesn't spoil their enjoyment, but they don't quite trust it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah, totally, and I like actually. that. I quite like that tension, yeah. which is why I wanted to end with the one real thing in the show is, there, is the actual it's photograph. Nice. Yeah. Well, I'd be in tears. I'm <laughs> tears when I see it. My mind goes to who all those other people were. You yeah. know, when you see those pictures, mm. because they will have all been so immensely talented and had their yeah, own totally. stories. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons we do mm. the podcast is to try and tell as many stories. Mm -hmm. And we hear about, you know, Char Charlie and Stan and uh, Ollie all the time, but who were the rest of them and mm. what were they up to and who were their kids getting dragged yeah. along? I just think it's gorgeous. The whole thing yeah, is, is so yeah. exciting. It is, you're right. And that world of which obviously your podcast revels in, which is brilliant, is that world that, in some ways, that lost world of music hall and, and, and as you say, the people that scratched a living from it, you know, mm. very skillful. But <laughs> Well, Charlie's parents, for a start, were music hall performers. Of course performers. they were. And, and, you know, to sustain any kind of living like that it must have been fiendishly difficult and what I love about it because of course I'm fascinated by performers and if, if the, sh the show celebrates obviously two extraordinary performers but it kind of celebrates the act of performance as yeah. well yeah. I, there's something virtuosic I think about the four guys that we have in the cast and I want that to be celebrated mm. um, but I also what I love about that kind of history uh, is it's not a history that's written down. So mm. I mentioned Joss Huben. When Joss works with us, some of the physical routines he is, we are sharing, you can trace all the way back to Carno and earlier. And yeah. these routines about how, how a drunk man falls or, or the, the, these were handed on. There was no book that went here. Yeah. The, they were passed on generation to generation. And of course, a lot of that died out because of TV and all of those. But there are still people who somehow have that kernel of of something that and as you say i'm fascinated when you see the people on the edges of those photos you kind of think oh yeah and even some of the people who became very successful performers you know uh, in, in both stan and ollie's film like jimmy finlayson mm -hmm. you know what yeah. a great performer and and then the guy whose name's going to escape me um who was also from carno's troop in chapman shorter films he's the big guy with the beard um, you know what I mean? Very, yes, he's always plays the big sort of. Yeah. And he he had a fasc I was reading about him a fascinating life when when uh, again Charlie got him over to do stuff there. But you kind of think you're right. There's a whole raft of people that exist like ghosts in that world of yeah. the yeah. That you're you're kind of it's kind of nodding towards them as well. Of mm. course. Yeah. You know? Well, let's delve into that because you've brought up Music Hall and Variety, which is the world that we're trying to delve into because there are so many ghosts and it isn't written down and that's one of the reasons we started mm -hmm. the podcast. So who are some people that have inspired you from that world? Or who's your favourite Variety Well, performer? Well, that's interesting. I suppose contemporary... And obviously a lot of this is me seeing clips of people, of course, you know, or, or my dad sharing stories of performers. One person who I, I was lucky enough to work with when he was still alive, who, who, who had come from that world, was a guy called Johnny Hutch. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd been in, at the kind of tail end of that mm -hmm. world of variety, I suppose. And he must have well into his 80s when I worked with him. And we did a couple of shows and he came and taught us some slapstick and some physical stuff and uh, that was fascinating because he yeah. kind of had a foot in that and had come yeah. from that and he would talk and reference performers which made me go away and look at them but in terms of glimpses from an earlier era a variety and, and glimpsing you know clips of them in things not much that exists I really like Frank Randall I thought mm. he was amazing when you see him especially I'll go back to the drunk man when you see him drunk yeah and he's <laughs> the brilliant when you see him fall down this roll down the stage you think how is he not dead <laughs> And, uh, and then he, he always talked about, you know, when you, whenever you fell, whether you were playing a drunk or not, mm -hmm. you should fall like a drunk man and all this kind of uh, stuff. And then there's another guy who I really like. And two people did this sketch, but I, 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 the one I can remember in a very old piece of film is Rob Wilton, the, mm -hmm. who, is, who does a brilliant thing where he's in a, 
He's, he runs a fire station and uh, someone rings up and there's clearly a fire and uh, he picks the phone up and he goes, oh, can I help you? And he, oh, you got a fire. Hang on, I can't find my pencil. I'll just... <laughs> And it, it's that. like, it's absolutely brilliant. Now, where, where are you? No, 82. Well, where's that? Is that next to the coal mongers? Um, and it's absolutely brilliant. That. While this person's house is burning down. <laughs> Hang on a minute. My kept, I've got a pan on the stove. I won't be, and, oh, it's absolutely brilliant. And I remember falling about, you know, that kind of routine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's all on YouTube as well. Yes. That's where I've seen yes. it. It's a blessing now. Is yes, it? you all can these go. That is brilliant. And then someone I adored. And it's one of my... Regrets talking about my uh, podcast. Regrets I've had a few. Uh, a performer I absolutely adored who again came out of the tradition was Max Wall. Mm. I just thought his physicality and his surreal yeah. behaviour, which I, as a kid, my dad loved him and he was laughing. I thought initially I couldn't quite understand it. Why? Yeah. You know, he's doing a thing where his arms aren't quite long enough to play the piano and he can't really. <laughs> and, thinking, ah. and then the brilliant walk, the eccentric mm. walk that yeah. he had and the weird costume. And, yeah. and as I got more into it, because I, my, you know, my dad laughed and so I wanted to laugh and and then of course he was an extraordinary like a lot of those performers was a very skillful actor I yeah. mean you know he wasn't only a, you know he was according to again legend Samuel Beckett's favourite actor you know mm-hmm. you kind oh, of go wow. in the way that that Beckett loved Lauren Hardy yes. and loved Buster Keaton uh-huh. and people of course associate Samuel Beckett with a very literary you know but he's he's mm. His, his obsession was musical yeah. and, the, and one um, of the most famous like literary double acts that he wrote as well exactly so. and, uh, <laughs> and inspired mu- people think oh that's why I kind of ex- I'm getting sidetracked now but the, my regret around Max Wall was as a young actor at drama school Max Wall was doing a Beckett play in London and for some stupid reason we ended up staying in the pub and I didn't go oh. and then about a year or so later Max Wall I wouldn't do that and I wouldn't be so uh, blasé but, um, but it's interesting we say about the Beckett thing because you know, people assume, as I said, he, 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 you know, he's coming from a very literary tradition, but his he's heroes were the Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> and also, I often think with something like Beckett, weirdly, it works best when you do have performers who are closer to the world of variety mm. rather than serious actors, if that makes right. sense. I think sometimes those those people who exist in that world in a different context, it can work brilliantly. But, uh, well, if you think about, like, Waiting for Godot, this because, I mean, it is really text-based, but so much of it's nonsense that, mm. it, like, it needs that physicality Definitely, and it needs yeah. the, the boredom kicks in a new experiment, which I think, like, they, Charlie Chaplin and <laughs> Stan Laurel, like, they must have had, mustn't they? It's like you said, like, Ollie used to go off and play golf. Yeah. So he, his mind was somewhere else, but that, that obsession of, of just like having the space and the time to do it, I think that's all written in Beck, Beckett's plays, isn't it? Yeah, so much sure. time. For sure, it's back to back time, it's true. And also those things where I remember reading about Buster Keaton and, and how they'd be in a room like this, there'd be a group of them, and they would just riff around ideas, mm-hmm. and then if it got too much, they would go off and play golf and come back. But that kind of obsessive thing about working out yeah. kind of material and, and, and ideas. I, and in some ways, I think we come, our work has this kind of, in terms of influences, it has a strange, partly to do with our interests, I suppose a mix of a kind of European influence mm. in some ways cinematically and, and, and through the people we work with but it's also given my childhood and my how you know what I was brought up on got a mm. very rich musical British yeah. variety f- vein that runs through it completely so um we're certainly trying to keep it alive in our own way, that's for sure. Well, well, one of the ways you do that, which we can touch on, although it's sold out, is through education, which I know you're doing the workshops on this with as part of the Mime Festival. Why is education so important to Told by an Idiot? Because you do so much work. I think, it, edu- well, education for us in terms of what we mean by it is kind of fundamental in a sense. And a large part of it for me is about access. I came, I was born in Birmingham, uh, there was no show business in my family at all. My mum was a dinner lady, my dad was an electrician, and I had no access to this world at all. In fact, when, it, when I was a 16 year old, I started to think, well, oh, maybe I could be an actor. It was kind of some bemused reaction. <laughs> people, from, people from here don't do that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That, uh, you know. That's and exactly what I got told in my careers meeting at school. So people from here don't, don't do, do that. that. that and I think that's sentence. the sad thing that it continues. It's, and I think it's, it's it's an awful thing to be told, oh no, it's not for the likes of us, it's not for the likes of you, it's not. And uh, I managed to ignore all of that and take a, take a <laughs> chance and, uh, and, and pursue a life in show business. But 
I think almost it feels not, not like a duty, but it does feel a passion of mine to kind of open up those possibilities for maybe for looking back at my younger self and, and working with kids or people who maybe don't always have that opportunity or that access to something. Mm. And, and I think that's a core part of, of what our work uh, with Talk by Nidhi is about. It's not really, we often talk about, you know, it's weird because we often say we're not trying to teach anybody anything. Yeah. All we're looking to do is share some stuff mm. and to provoke people and be provoked. So mm. it's it, it's around, as I said, opening up the possibilities for people. And and I kind of feel, I do feel quite passionate about the fact that we have a world where still, you know, the performance is still often dominated by the middle classes and yeah. people who can afford to go to study or go <laughs> to drama school. And not everybody can. And even Jerome, who plays... Um, uh, Stan in our show and I, he was our last guest on our podcast and I was asking him about his childhood and the beginnings of getting into the, and uh, he said about how he was offered a place at drama school and he couldn't afford to go and mm. I think it's important that people hear that, that that for a lot of people going to study to be a performer of any sort is not an option mm -hmm. Yes, and I think if you can do anything uh, to help people access it then I think that's, that's got to be a good thing so it's, that's why we do it really Wonderful. Fantastic. Well, a question we always ask, and I've been dying to ask you this question, Paul, is theatres. What are some of your favourite theatres that you've ever performed in, that you've ever connected with? Wow. Theatres I've loved playing. Well, I love The Unity. I mentioned mm -hmm. it. It's got a real nostalgia for me. Graham Phillips, who, who ran it for many years, and he gave us a real break 30 years ago when we did our first show in Edinburgh and no one knew who we were, and we were desperately trying to get another gig, and, and he saw us and he said, no, you can come here and... Uh, and I've always loved that space. I always, and also I've, I've always liked playing Liverpool. I, of course, it's a great city of comedy. Yeah. And Ken Dodd. I remember when we were we saw some of him live because we years ago we were doing a show, and our show was about I don't know two hours. And when we came off, he still had two hours to go because it was <laughs> notorious for the length of his show. So, <laughs> yeah. so Liverpool, we, I love another theatre in that part of the world. Actually, which is one of my favourite spaces. We made three shows there. Is the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester? Oh yeah, yeah. it's one of my favourite theatres ever. I just think it's partly also to do with that extraordinary building and mm -hmm. what they did by putting that you know yeah. extraordinary kind of spaceship sort of in the round. But I just love it. I think yeah. for me, actually, to be fair, we 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 didn't do that with this, but. Uh, the round for me is the most exciting space really it's the mm -hmm. most democratic space mm. I like the fact that everybody can see it you can see the rest of the audience it's like a circus yeah um, and in the exchange you can sometimes see the actors running absolutely. around which I quite like so. yeah, yeah 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 it is it's yeah everything's kind of declared you know what mm. I mean it's, um, and it's an interesting space the round because I've worked with actors I've directed there where actors who haven't played it are quite nervous mm. because you know they kind of go what you mean they can see me all the time you go, mm. yeah 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 there's nowhere to hide you can't hide at the back and initially they're like and then when they get confident with it they love it yeah. because as I said it's, it, it, it declares everything it mm. kind of uh, uh, so I'd say those two spaces are and I, I can't end without talking about Wilson's musical as yeah. well I mean it's it, you know in terms of our show it couldn't be more perfect I mean I don't think this is necessarily true but there is a legend again that says that possibly Chaplin's dad played there so we kind of leapt on that I'm sure it's not true but uh, I think for us it couldn't it, of course it has it's the perfect space and it has such history yeah and of course uh, the Robert Downey Jr film was yes, filmed they there filmed them. they yeah. filmed they filmed the bit I just said when he's falling out of the thing in the, yeah. in that thing so no it'd be brilliant to be back there yeah so if you could wake up tomorrow morning and have any god given talent which you have many, we've already decided. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, what else could Paul have? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but if you could wake up and be any variety performer of any choice, what would your act be? That's a really brilliant question. I, this is weird because I don't have the body for it, so you often envy what you don't have mm. you know, in life. Mm -hmm. But so, this is why it's well, so any, anything. This is anything. So yeah. that's why I, I, I can change my body shape, of course, if it's anything. On it. I think I'd like to be a really good eccentric dancer. But I think you, I think you need to be tall and thin. When I've seen the people that <laughs> really made me laugh, with eccentric dance they've often had very funny legs and, mm. and and that's not me my comedy sits somewhere else but i think the ability to create laughter from moving and and dancing in a eccentric way i think would be my to what song to what song <laughs> 
That's a good. Oh, what good, style? What style? I think um, it's weird. I probably if it's something from that um, uh, from the more of that musical world, it might be. It might be something like uh, something with a kind of bossa nova vibe to it. Mm. Nice. Kind of a, I don't know. It's a there shame this isn't a visual no, podcast because no, no, they were some no, good moves. No. Well, we always end, yeah. as as we know you do, with a this or that round. Oh, good. We do. So, would you rather watch a Charlie Chaplin or a Laurel and Hardy? On this day, because <laughs> I, it's a very hard question. On this day, I'd go Charlie Chaplin. The Gold Rush or The Kid? I would say there's something about the Gold Rush that somehow for me has more invention or mm-hmm. more comic invention. But I love the mix of the comedy and the pathos, so I'm going to go the kid. Oh, yes, I would pick the kid. I think it's a brilliant oh, kid. Are you a press night partier or a stage door sneak out? Uh, ooh, I like a party. Don't always like it on the press night, but I'll say, but I'm a stay. I'll go. I'll go press night party. Woo! <laughs> Would you rather be sat in the audience or waiting in the wings? I think waiting in the wings. I think this is coming back to the people often ask me directing or acting, and I love both, and one informs the other. But one, if you're directing, you have no control mm. once it starts, and you shouldn't have any control. It's up to yeah. those. But I, 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 nervous as you might be, I'd rather I'd rather be in the wings about to come on, because then at least you can affect something you can't if you're in the bar after free gin and tonic unless you stand up like a mad person stop (laughs) which i'm sure you've wanted to do a few times (laughs) yeah i have and would you rather be looking out over canada water or helsinki uh i much as i love canada water (laughs) (laughs) uh, i'll have to be honest and say i'd rather be looking at helsinki oh fabulous well thank you so much for joining us today it's been the biggest pleasure honestly we could talk to you for hours no it's really lovely to talk to people who have a passion for something that I really really love and uh, thanks for having me thank you oh Paul thank you so so much I know we say this all the time but it's true every time that we say it I could have talked to him all day there's something so satisfying isn't there when you're in a conversation with someone who knows what they're talking about and you feel so safe and the time just flies and yet at the same time you've you're so changed by the conversation that it feels like you were with them for like a weekend when I came away from the interview I remember thinking oh I didn't say very much during that interview I didn't sort of contribute to the flow of the conversation very much and it's because I realized afterwards that I was actually quite overwhelmed by the subject matter and what he was talking about. And all of that felt really personal to me. I mean, I love Stan Laurel. We, we, you know, we said in the interview about how much I love Stan Laurel. And to hear somebody share that passion and to hear somebody talk about it as in-depth as I always want to talk about it, mm-hmm. I, fa- I really did f- find it quite overwhelming and I found it really moving. And yeah, like you say, I just wanted to just sit and absorb all of what he had to say, which was, it was magic. Well, that's what I said to you because we went to the rehearsal then and it was, that was then a different experience actually Mm. seeing what the theory of what he was talking about in practice. And I said to you, didn't I, were you a bit emotional then? Because I could see, I could see you in the interview, you know, Micah, as you all know, is, is so, um, He's got a lot of bravado going on, a lot of charm. <laughs> and um, and in this, it was you were completely stripped back. And I, I remember looking at your eyes and it you looked so overwhelmed. And I thought, oh, gosh, he's met his match here. So that mm. was really special. And thank you to Paul and everyone at Told by an Idiot that arranged that interview for us because it was really a one-off. Anyone who can catch the show, make sure you go. And please let us know what your favorite thing about the show was in our comments down below if you're listening on YouTube or on our social media or you can leave us a speak pipe we always love a good speak pipe and maybe you can tell us what are some of your favorite Stan and Charlie moments from the movies because we've all got them and remember to tune in next week to hear more information about the International Mind Festival we can't wait to delve a little bit deeper into that but for now all that's left for us to say is see you next week was told by Ginger. Do you remember that show?